India is in a very relevant moment. Uh, population is moving from rural areas to uh, cities at a very uh, uh, speed range of uh, 50,000 people every day. And uh, those big cities, those metropolis, are really the engine of the economy of countries and are going to be, are already, the engine of the economy of India. So it is essential that the metropolis of India work and that is what we are going to have a look at uh, in this presentation. We are going to uh, look first at the importance of metropolis around the world, how and why they are so relevant for countries. We are going to see how, those, uh, how metropolises are managed, metropolitan management, the basic principles of metropolitan management. And we are going to have a look at uh, some of the metropolitan metropolises of India, especially the ones that the European Union with ACCIONA have been working on, we have been working on for these last uh, three years. And there are some uh, relevant conclusions that should be implemented to make those metropolises work better than they are actually working. No? and to improve uh, the position of those metropolis and consequently the position of India in the world and uh, the, the relevance of India's uh, economy in a world context, in a globalized uh, context. The, uh, the world is experiencing a phenomenon that has never existed before in the history of the world. We are moving from the countryside, uh, the rural areas, to metropolises. And this is uh, not an exponential curve, because obviously the population of the world is, is uh, li limited and the growth of it is going to be as well limited. We are probably going to reach 11 billion people, no? But uh, the movement from, from uh, the rural to the, uh, to the cities is taking a pace. Uh, India is actually 30% uh, uh, urban, 70% rural. And at the end of the process of urbanization, is going to be around 75-80% uh, urban and only 20% rural. And that is part of the uh, development process. All developed countries have that kind of range or rate uh, between urban and rural. So if India is going to be developed, when India will be completely developed, it will have 80% uh, urban and 20% uh, rural. That makes that uh, the, the, the process of uh, urbanization means that every day in the world, 300,000 people are moving to cities, and India is the country which is moving faster because uh, there is a lot of rural uh, population and is moving at 50,000 50, people every day. 50,000 people every day, uh, that, that means a, a, a metropolis of 1.5 million people every month. And this is going to go on for 20, 30 years. So India has to build a metropolis of 1.5 million people every month. The challenge is enormous. And that is why we have to do it right, because if we don't do it right, the cost of uh, upgrading or redoing uncontrolled growth in the future is going to cost three to nine times more than if we do it right from scratch. And that is the relevant element of uh, our, our challenge. In the world, there has been only, uh, in the history of the world, for the last 6,000 years, there has only been three cities that were 700,000 plus inhabitants. That was Rome of Julius Caesar, Caesar that was Beijing of uh, the Ming Dynasty, that was London of Queen Victoria from 600,000 to 1 million. From three, now it's 500. 500 cities with more than 1 million inhabitants. And those 500 cities, they produce 75% of the GDP of the world. So really the GDP of the world is made in the metropolis and those metropolis are much more productive, efficient economically than the rest of the country. So that's why if the metropolis of a country do not work, that country doesn't work. It is not a local problem, it's not a metropolitan problem, it's a national problem that really uh, involves the strategy of the national government that has to be involved in this process. So, uh, in, in federal systems, as we are going to see further on, there has, must be a collaboration between the national federal uh, government and the state government, and that is how the governance of the metropolis is worked together. Metropolises are extremely powerful, extremely uh, efficient, and they are as efficient as, con as countries. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, metropolis like uh, Dallas, 
which has the GDP of Argentina. Metropolises like uh, 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 Los Angeles, San Diego, that has the GDP of Spain. Madrid has the GDP of Peru. Uh, Paris has three times the GDP of Colombia. So really, the metropolis are so powerful, they are as powerful as countries. And within the countries, they are extremely powerful as well. In the USA, which is 25% of the GDP of the world, uh, five of those metropolises are already 25% uh, uh, of the GDP of the USA. So those metropolises are more or less 1% of the GDP of, of, of the world. Each metropolis of them is 1% of the GDP of the world. If we, if we put those metropolises within the context of, of, uh, of countries, and you see in this uh, slide, in black countries with their GDP, and in red the metropolis with their GDP, you know, you see that among the 100 most uh, productive units in the world, those countries are ranked by their GDP. The first one is the European Union. If it's all the countries of the European Union is, is a bit more than the United States, the first one, uh, the, if not, is the United States, second China, Japan, Germany, and so on. If we uh, rank those uh, cities and we introduce the metropolises, we see that the metropolis uh, number uh, 14 is going to be Tokyo. The country number 14 would be Tokyo. The 15 will be New York, uh, Los Angeles will be 20, Chicago 24, and so on. Among the 100 most important uh, uh, territorial units productive uh, that produce uh, economic output uh, GDP, 46 are already metropolises. So really, almost 50% of the most productive 100 areas of the world are already metropolis, and those metropolis are much more powerful than countries. And, and at a certain extent, for instance, uh, Mumbai uh, is, has a GDP higher than Pakistan, and uh, Delhi has a GDP equal to Beijing. No? So, and if those metropolis were, as you see in the slide, uh, Delhi and Mumbai are in the third column, but if we achieve that Delhi and Mumbai, instead of being in the third column, would be in the second column or even in the first column, India will not be number nine in GDP of the world, India will be number three or number two. So really the essence of the metropolis is the positioning of India in the world economy as a world power. We are dealing with a new dimension of, of uh, management of the territory. We are used to architecture, uh, 150. We are used to uh, urban design, 1,500. And then you go on in those scales, which is uh, growing scales. Uh, urban planning is 1,500,000. Uh, metropolitan planning is 150,000. Uh, then national uh, planning, 1,500,000. Uh, India is not a, a, only a country, it's really a continent, no? So, uh, continental planning, one five million, and the world, one fifty million. So, each of those scales of territorial management requires a different set of disciplines and a different set of governance or client, no? From uh, an architectural product, and an architectural object, which is a family or an institution, to urban planning, which is the municipality, which is uh, the, the community, the, the, the people, to uh, national planning or even the world, which is 150 million, and then it's the big institutions of the world, like, like the World Bank or the uh, United Nations or NATO or so on. Uh, each one of them has a different set of disciplines. And we are now dealing with a new dimension, which is metropolitan planning, that never before in the history of the world we, we had to deal uh, with. No? And that dimension uh, is the 150,000, which requires a different set of disciplines, completely different from urban planning. So if you try to do metropolitan planning as you do urban planning, you are going to, to, to do a lot of mistakes, you are going to be wrong. That's what we are going to see. For instance, in a city, you have a structure which is pyramidal or, or, or uh, uh, circular, orbital. No, You have the mayor in the center, you have the deputy mayors around the mayor, you have the chiefs of the departments, the departments, the service, and the population. 
And then in a city is, a un is what is called a unitary system. The mayor gives the orders, uh, receives the information, processes, gives the orders to the deputy mayors, and so on and so on. And the process in a city is the, the need for, a, for the mayor to listen to the population, is the top-down, bottom-up dialogue between that kind of pyramidal structure. And so on. In a metropolis, it's not at all like that. Nothing to do. It doesn't have any, uh, any similarity at all. No? In a metropolis, you have many actors, many stakeholders. You have all the municipalities, which are part of the metropolis. Then you have, in, in a federal system like, like India, you have the different secretariats, uh, secretariats of, of, the, of the state, Maharashtra, the different uh, transport, uh, health, uh, education, and so on. Then you have the different agencies that are involved in metropolitan management, like transport or water or electricity, power, uh, waste management, and so on. And, and all of those have their own competences given by law and given by the constitutional structure. No? In a federal state, every one of the tiers of government has a different responsibility. And you cannot infringe, you cannot impose from one tier to the other tier something which belongs to the other tier and they are competent to decide. So what you have is to have a constant dialogue between all those stakeholders. It's more of a matrix, it's more of a reticula where everyone has to talk to and those decisions made by those agreements of those two stakeholders has to be as open as possible, as transparent as possible, in such a way that third parties can see how that decision will affect them and take their own decisions according to, to those uh, processes. So it's a really completely different from an orbital system with a, or pyramidal to a reticular matrix system is completely different. And if you, if you try to apply the way of planning, decision making of a city to a metropolis, you are going to be wrong. So that's what we are going to see. That's what we need to develop specifically for the metropolis of India. Metropolitan uh, management. In, in the metropolis, we have mainly five sectors that we have to integrate. Uh, it's the environment, the ecology, the environment, it's transport, it's housing, it's productive activities, and it's social facilities. Out of those five sectors, units of, of, of management, uh, two of them are continuous systems and they are the most difficult to integrate because they generally uh, fall into conflict, enter into conflict. Because when you have two continuous systems within a territory, they are going to, to interact and, and enter into conflict. Those are environment and transport. Uh, transport, obviously, you cannot have a kilometer of train and then nothing and then another kilometer of train. The train has to be continuous and then you arrive to the station, which has to be intermodal. You get down from the train into a BRT or into a taxi or into a, your bicycle. You know? And the environment, all the parks from national parks, regional parks, uh, peri-metropolitan parks, urban parks and local parks, they all have to be integrated because of biodiversity. Animals have to be able to flow from the larger parks to the smaller parks and vice versa, so you have an integrated environment. So when you have those two systems within a territory, they are going to conflict and you have to solve those conflicts. The other three, which are housing, productive activities, industry, commerce, uh, offices, or uh, social facilities, health, uh, education, sports, uh, leisure, and so on, they are discontinuous. They are systems, because the system of health, the different uh, hospitals have to, to work together uh, depending on the, on the illness that you have, the population has, but they, they are not located all in the same location. They can be scattered in uh, strategic locations around the metropolis. So the main project, the main uh, challenge of the metropolis is to, how to coordinate and organize uh, the environment and uh, transport. And when you are able to coordinate all those processes with this kind of reticular system in a, in a dialogue among all these institutions, then you have a metropolis that works. And there are two issues. Uh, the OCD has made an analysis by which they have seen that when you double the number of institutions in a metropolis, when you double the number, the metropolises lose 6% of the productivity. And uh, the other aspect of it is when you uh, increase reduce or increase the, 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 un, the system of governance to making it more efficient because it's more unitary and more dialogue, you increase by 15% the, the uh, efficiency of the metropolis. And to prove that is that 
One metropolis which is very often presented as a successful metropolis that uh, is very well managed, and that's why it has a very strong position around the world, is Singapore. And why is Singapore so efficient is because Singapore is a city nation. They are able to, to integrate all the decisions that have to be made in a metropolis to make that metropolis efficient. And I'm not only talking about physical decisions about transport or housing, I'm talking as well the budget of health, the laws, the whole system of governance in the metropolis of Singapore is integrated because it's a nation and they are able to integrate all that. So really the more integrated a metropolis is, the more efficient it's going to be and the more it will be strategically positioned in the globalization process around the world. When metropolis are more efficient, when they are larger. And, uh, the larger you are, the more efficient you are. This is an economic uh, phenomena. It's called the economies of scale in, in economy. And so, um, but it's as well a, a, a metabolic, a biological uh, process. No? A species of animals, which is the double of another species, is 15% more efficient because it consumes 50%, 15% more, uh, less uh, um, uh, energy than, than two uh, specimens of the, of the uh, smaller species. So when you increase, you double the size of a metropolis, you immediately increase by 15% the whole capacity of that metropolis uh, to be, to be uh, uh, production. No? And that uh, makes that the metropolis that are well managed, managed in a system of a metropolitan unit and become larger and integrate the different uh, parts of the metropolis, because it's not only having a metropolis of two million uh, people and inviting another two million to live in the metropolis, is having different municipalities well integrated and instead of being separated municipalities of 100,000 uh, people, having a million or two million integrated by the transport system, uh, that metropolis becomes much more efficient, much more effective, and even it can go to 50% or 60% more efficiency than, than having a disaggregated, uncoordinated, with no transport system metropolis. And the proof of that, as we can see in the in this slide, is the comparison between uh, Delhi, London, Bogota and Tokyo. To the right you see the densities of uh, Delhi and Bogota all in the center because there is not a transport system which is efficient enough to integrate the whole metropolis. And in the other side, uh, London and, and Tokyo, that you see is not sprawl because there are centralities where the population is located around the TODs, the urban centralities, the transport system, the ha heavy uh, transport system, which is uh, in the metropolis beyond three or four million inhabitants, is, is mainly rail. Around those uh, stations is the location, but then they can, those uh, urban centralities create a polycentrism around the, the metropolis, and you have a, a diverse location of possibilities and integrated through the transport system. Those two examples, physical, of concentration because there is no transport system, or a rich transport system with different modes, trains, BRTs, uh, tramways, and so on, you can see to the, to the left the different plans of, of those four metropolis. You see that in, the, in London and Tokyo there are different uh, 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 management authorities, tiers of government, national, regional, uh, urban, and so on. And in the other uh, case, in Delhi or Bogota, in Bogota there is only the municipality that has a set of BRTs, and you take uh, in Bogota three hours to go to your work. No? And at the end, you, you pay a very high price for that discoordination and that lack of uh, a unitary system. And the proof of it is that Bogota has a GDP of $17,000 and, and London has a GDP of $73,000. So if he, India wants really to, to multiply by five or by 10 the GDP of their metropolises per capita, really it has to integrate that transport system in a unitary uh, system and not have it disintegrated. So metropolis have a different uh, systems that have to be integrated. And uh, they have uh, mainly the confrontation of two objectives, which are essential to understand 
the, the management, uh, the political management of a metropolis. In a metropolis, you have the objective of economic efficiency. Uh, the economics is, is a sector, uh, and, and the objective is efficiency. The social sector, the objective is equity. And the uh, environmental sector, uh, artificial environment and natural environment. Natural environment is obviously the ecology, but artificial is the urban uh, structure. The environment as a whole, uh, artificial, uh, the urban and, and the physical. The objective is sustainability. And those objectives generally are confronting. No? And mainly uh, the, uh, the uh, people that have experience in uh, political management realize that with a limited budget, you have to decide if you want to focus that budget into social objective of equity, and then you have to disperse the budget among those who have not, or if you uh, want to promote the economic efficiency, and then you have to concentrate that budget, that budget in processes of economic efficiency, and then that concentration takes apart many people that are not going to benefit in the first uh, uh, phase of that uh, economic development, maybe in the second, but not in the first phase. So really that dichotomy is a confrontation of political management, and it is in metropolitan management. And among those uh, dialectic uh, between that confrontation, there is the, the sector of the environment, the location of the elements of the metropolis that in some way cannot solve the problem of that confrontation, but can help to uh, to, to soothe the, 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 uh, the, this process by the location of social facilities closest to those who, who need it, and, and by the transport providing, uh, transport for the labor force, uh, for the uh, larger market, etc. And that kind of uh, conflicts that have to be solved, they have to be solved by the institutions, by the governance. And when we talk about governance, we are not talking about the government. We are talking about the dialogue between the public sector and the private sector, you know, because both of them are responsible of the management of the metropolis. And it is that uh, governance and that dialogue that really uh, finds out the, the balance, the most socially equitable, economic efficiently, and environmentally sustainable balance between those three uh, elements. No? Metropolises like cities, when they grow, they have to change the mechanisms of physical uh, organization. Uh, when you are small, the circle is the most efficient form because with less uh, infrastructure, which is the line of the circle, you have the more space inside. And that was obvious in medieval times when you had a city and you have a wall. The wall was very expensive for that kind of economy, so they tried to make the wall as short as possible and to have the more land possible inside. So that's why these medieval cities were mainly round. But when you grow, uh, this, this uh, circular shape enters in, in many contradictions. One of them is that when you have a city which is monocentric, the people that own the land at the center, they control the market. The market is controlled by supply. And a market should never be controlled by supply. It should be controlled by demand. So the uh, monocentric metropolis at the end is inefficient because the market will extract, uh, suck from, from the economic processes the benefits of that economic processes by the, 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 the ownership of the land that will be able to impose uh, through a monopoly any price. Another problem of the uh, circular monocentric metropolis is, is that as everything happens in the center where most of the infrastructure is located, everyone has to work to the center, everyone wants to be in the center, people uh, take the radials to go to the center, those radials get jammed, and then immediately the, that the jam of those radials start to affect the feeder routes to those radials and the, uh, the jam grows, uh, grows along and you get congestion and at the end you can even have a gridlock. So that is what we call unstable equilibrium uh, because once the equilibrium is there, well, that's fine, but once it starts to break, really the, the, the disequilibrium of the whole system grows. In a reticular system that many cities along the history of the world the Greeks, the Romans, uh, uh, the Spaniards in Latin America, the Anglo-Saxons, the English in North America, the Chinese, the, the Indians, uh, 
uh, have uh, understood that once the cities grow, they cannot be just monocentric. They have to have a grid system. No? Because into a grid system, the land, uh, land is controlled by demand and not by supply. If someone in a grid system decides to charge more for the land, you can always take the plot which is side to it on in the next block, and it, it is as, as, as communicated, as, as connected as, as any other plot. So it is demand, the demand that controls the market, and that is much more efficient. And from two points in a, in a grid, you can use many, many uh, roads, trips, and if any of the segment is congested, you can take the parallel one. So the system of uh, congestion is uh, in equilibrium. The system is equilibrated because it automatically equilibrates itself and it does not expand to the whole grid. So it's much more efficient when you grow beyond a small dimension to have a polycentric grid system. And we have experienced that in urban scale and we now are experiencing that in metropolitan scale. So now the metropolis are not working anymore in a monocentric radial orbital uh, system, not any more ring roads and ring roads uh, like uh, onion rings. Uh, they are more uh, working into a polycentric system of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, of a grid of uh, networks of highways and roads rather than the, of, of the concentric. So we are moving from the problem of either concentrating for economic efficiency or dis dispersing for uh, social uh, equity to a system which, uh, which is agreed where locations are alternative and you can always find spaces in between those locations for the social uh, equity approach to locate the population closer to the areas where they work or where they have the social facilities that they need for, for, uh, for uh, their normal living in the city. So we are moving from a circular metropolis to a reticular polycentric metropolis and that is what makes metropolis more efficient around the world. No? And to, to give an image about that, what we say is that we are not any more playing dots, where you have to put your dot in the center of the, of the, of the uh, circle. We are playing chess. We are playing chess where every one of the squares has a different role to play, and the whole system has a strategy, which is the strategy of the metropolis with the location of the functions within each of the squares. So we are not playing any more dots, we are playing chess. And as in chess, Every one of the figures of the chess, pieces of the chess, has a different role to play. And uh, obviously the king is the central figure of the chess and the king has to be protected. Normally the king in a metropolis is the old historical center with all the cultural values of the metropolis, the symbolism, the symbology of the metropolis, the identity of the metropolis. But as in chess, the king is not the, strat uh, the strategic piece of the, of the metropolis. The strategic piece of the metropolis is the queen is she who, who makes really the connection between the location of the rooks, of the knights, of the bishops and the pawns and really organizes the metropolis. And generally in a metropolis, the queen is more the, uh, the uh, main economic center which is related, if it's a global metropolis, related to the airport or to the port. Uh, because that is the international economy and that is what positions that metropolis into the global context. So the queen is the one, but then the different uh, pieces, uh, some of the municipalities will be rooks, some of the municipalities will be bishops or some of the municipalities will be knights. And everyone has to understand what is their role and to play it as, as good as, as, as possible. Obviously, the role of each municipality depends on the mayor and the, uh, the uh, county council, the city council. But if they don't understand their role and try to play a role which is not theirs, they are going probably to spend a lot of public budget of their, of their uh, constituents in projects which are wrong and are going to be uh, failures in the future, even if they sell those projects at the, at the beginning as a political gain. No, if a pawn tries to play uh, the role of a queen uh, in the chess uh, at the end is going to, 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 to end badly and not to, to play the role that uh, it's, uh, he, he should play better. And uh, this location of uh, pieces in a, in a metropolis, 
this is the example of Madrid, where the king is, the central uh, place of Madrid, and the queen and so on, but can be done for every metropolis. And if the uh, tiers of government understand what is the, the best role for them to play, then they will play it right and the uh, success of the metropolis will be uh, assured. Then in a metropolis, it's so complex to manage and uh, not at all like a city. In a city, you can make a master plan, you can make a development plan that you can uh, decide and you have to decide what is the function and the use that uh, is going to be given to every, every plot, no? where the hospital has to be, where the uh, stadium has to be, where the resident has to be. If that resident has to be single family, it has to be terrace, it has to be collective uh, residence uh, uh, flo uh, with floors. Um, but in a metropolis, it's so, so complex that you, are, you cannot regul regulate the use of the land to the detail that you can do in a municipality. In a metropolis, you have to work with the strategy of the metropolis, and then you have to decide which are the big projects which are going to change the structure of the metropolis by locating that big project, an airport, a port, an Olympic stadium, uh, a, a hospital, uh, those, uh, a, a train system, a highway system, the location of uh, scientific development uh, areas. Uh, those are the big projects that really structure the metropolis. And you have to decide where to put it. So that's what we call a metropolitan acupuncture. Because like in acupuncture, you put the needle and you have to know where you put the needle to make, to make it work and to have the general uh, impact in the, in the whole body because you know what that nerve serves and how that nerve is going to impact in the whole body. So we call it uh, metropolitan acupuncture and to, to, uh, to, to be able to do that metropolitan acupuncture, you must have an acupuncture chart. You don't put the needle anywhere you put the needle in the specific position that is needed to have the impact that you want. And in the same way, you have a, 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 an acupuncture chart for the human body, and, uh, you ha must have an acupuncture chart for the metropolis to understand what is the role of every one of those cities or those uh, uh, centers within the metropolis. If you don't have that, is what we call the strategy of the mosquito you only find a bit of uh, skin which is uh, uh, free uh, and then you, the mosquito goes there and uh, puts his needle and tries to suck as much uh, blood as possible and then goes to somewhere else where, where it is again free and sucks more blood in that somewhere else. And I'm not talking about the private sector, the developer, whose role is to make as much money as possible, so he finds a good location to make a building and he tries to make that building there. That's, that's, his role is not the vision of the whole metropolis because he's not in the government. I'm talking as well many times about mayors or, or uh, metropolitan managers that really do not know the, how the metropolis works and then they have a project of making a hospital and then they have an empty plot and they say, well, let's make it in this empty plot. And, and the, without understanding what is the vocation of that en empty plot within the metropolis or if the uh, uh, um, hospital has really to be there or should be somewhere else. That's what we call the strategy of the mosquito. And as uh, in, uh, in acupuncture, every metropolis, every animal has a different uh, acupuncture chart and uh, every metropolis has a different acupuncture chart, has a different mental map, has a different metro, uh, metro matrix diagram. No? And it's not the same uh, to, have, to, to make acupuncture to a, to a horse or to a dog or to a pig or to a cow, then you have to have the, 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 the acupuncture chart of every animal you are working in. And is, is, as in the metropolis, here you, you have the example of nine, uh, acupuncture charts, uh, mental maps, metro, metro matrix diagrams of uh, nine metropolises around the world. You have uh, Cairo, Mumbai, Mexico, Tehran, Istanbul, Maputo, Abuja, uh, Bogota and Nairobi. And as you see, they are completely different. And in each case, when you have a strategy of locating something which is relevant for the metropolis, it has to be in a different location and you have to understand the metropolis to do that. And we have done that for several of the metropolis of India that we are going to see in, in the next uh, phase. Um, a metropolis is a metropolis. 
because it is located in an advantage location. No, uh, there was a theory in the in the uh, 30s, 37, 1937, about central place theory that meant that uh, if you have a different set of, of cities, they will organize themselves in a system that will be homogeneous and will have an hexagonal uh, structure. So more circular, hexagonal. No? Um, but the main element of that theory, which is called the central place theory, was that it had to be in a featureless plane, in a plane without topographic uh, significant elements. No? But a metropolis is never in a, in a featureless plane. A metropolis is a metropolis because generally it controls two ecosystems. It's the gate between two ecosystems, the land and the sea, so it's a port, or it is a, a valley with a river, so it's the passage of the river in a, a more convenient place than any other place, or it is the, the ridge of mountains with a passage across, and then the metropolis is at the, at the passage of that, that controls the passage of that ridge of mountains. And we can give the examples of New York, which is the air canal that brings the goods from central, the, the center of Mississippi, Mississippi Valley and the Great Lakes uh, to New York and then to Europe and vice versa. And that's why New York is New York. And once you have developed that uh, uh, relevant positioning, you become a financial center and you become the, the capital, the financial capital of the world. No? Or Paris. Paris is Paris because uh, there were two islands in the Seine and it was more convenient to make two small bridges and one large one, and that's why uh, Julius Caesar uh, decided to cross the Seine and to, to go north of, of, of France into, into Germany. Or London is London, because uh, at the time of the invasion of the Romans, the, uh, the tides of, uh, went just to London, so make a pontoon bridge, which is a bridge with barges, uh, with boats, uh, cannot be done when the uh, when the uh, uh, tide will break the bridge. So London is London as well because of a specific location of control of two ecosystems. So uh, metropolises have ma mainly four typologies. No? The ones which are coastal metropolises, uh, for example, New York or Mumbai. Uh, river metropolises, Paris, London, New Delhi. No? Pass metropolises like uh, Colón, Madrid, or Pune, or valley metropolises like Medellín, Quito. And I don't have an example in India, but uh, I am sure that there are examples in India. Uh, so we have really not a, a, a system of hexagonal systems, circular systems. We have systems which are uh, defined by that directionality. Because when two ecosystems, sea and, and, and land, interact. Uh, obviously, the coast is not a straight line, but it is more or less a straight line. No? Or a river might have meanders, no? but it is a straight line. Or, or a ridge of mountains is a straight line. So, so metropolis are never circular. Metropolis have always one main directionality, and that directionality creates a gradient of intensity uh, uh, by the distance to that, the river. So the distance to the river is a gradient of, uh, of intensity. And then those gradients create a slope of uh, intensity that creates a perpendicular system of the secondary directionality of the metropolis. So a metropolis has a main directionality and a secondary directionality which is perpendicular to the first one. And we are going to see that in the metropolis of India because that works in the metropolis around the world. So in this kind of system of acupuncture, no, uh, of, of, the, of the structure of the metropolis, you immediately see that uh, if something is missing, the metropolis doesn't work. It's like uh, the, the uh, roof truss of an industrial building. Uh, we call in engineering, it is called isostatic roof trusses, and in, by isostatic, it means that if you take out any node or you take out any, any bar of the system, the whole thing breaks. So in a metropolis, when you understand the acupuncture chart of the metropolis and you see that a highway is missing or a train is missing or a center is missing, uh, you immediately see that that's why the metropolis doesn't work and then you can decide, I have to do this train, I have to do this highway, I have to do that. No? Um, and we have done that in many metropolises around the world, and I could give examples of uh, 50 
40 metropolises around the world, where we detected the, the missing of one of these big infrastructure projects, and they have been decided or done in the last 20 years. For instance, in Madrid, Madrid uh, was a shape of, of, of a butterfly, and we will see that later on for New Delhi. And that butterfly uh, was all, uh, the two wings were linked to the center, and it was missing the connection between the two wings to make it more resilient and to make it more uh, capable of avoiding the, uh, the, the uh, congestions of the center by, by all, everyone uh, needing to go to the center. And that's why uh, uh, 15 years ago, we decided that we had to make the M45, and we did the M45 and the uh, two million inhabitants to the uh, northeast uh, of uh, Madrid and the two million inhabitants to the southwest of Madrid are connected by the M45 and has taken a lot of, uh, of congestion from the center, from the M30 and so on. Uh, another example, in uh, Santiago de Chile, uh, 20 years ago, we made this analysis and we immediately saw that a train was missing and we suggested the construction of that train and the train has been produced in these 17 years and it is working perfectly well and you can actually visit it. Let's, let's say in the analogies that we're using with the roof trusses and the, uh, that it is like an emoji, no? uh, you, you, you have the, the abstract uh, diagram of a human face and if you see that an eye is missing, you immediately say, well, we have to design, we have to put an eye to that face, and then you design the, you design the eye with, with all the details that are needed, like in the case of Santiago de Chile, the train, obviously, was with all the engineering of making the train. No? And here are 16 examples of that kind of analysis, uh, mental maps, uh, diagrammatic acupuncture analysis of, of 16 metropolises around the world. And those projects are either being made and uh, built or are uh, in the process of being built or are being decided to be built. And there are 16, but I could uh, bring up to 40 of those examples. The I Indian metropolis performance is essential for the future of India and the positioning of India in, uh, in the structure of the world. Let me say, even uh, if uh, uh, this can uh, be open to a discussion, that in the history of the world there has been mainly uh, six, uh, seven uh, cultures. No? The first one to exist, the more ancient one, is the animist culture that it now is still surviving in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Then the Indian culture, which is uh, 12,000 years old. The Mahabharata uh, shows a phenomena of the sky that by computer has been analyzed that happened 12,000 years ago. Uh, then it's the Persian, the Persian, uh, the Assyrians, the Sumerians, and then uh, the Babylonians and the Persians, and the Chinese, more or less uh, at the same time. Then it's the Western culture, and there was the, uh, the culture of America, the Aztecs and the Incas, but they have not survived and now they are mixed within the Western culture because Latin America is really part of the Western culture. And then there is the, uh, the Arab uh, culture that was created in the year 600, was expanded in the year 600 uh, with, with the prophet. No? Uh, out of these uh, six cultures, really the number of people that are involved in each of them is uh, very different. We have three main cultures around the world which are 1.4 billion people. That is China, 1.4 billion people. That is India, 1.4 billion people. And the Western culture, if uh, we uh, add up uh, the USA, uh, uh, Europe, Latin America and Australia, it is as well 1.4 billion people. If we compare that with the Iranians, Persian culture, which is uh, 200 million, including Central Asia, if we uh, take into account the uh, Arab culture, which is uh, half a billion, uh, 400, uh, 400 million, half a billion, if we take the uh, sub-Saharan culture, which is uh, 1 billion people, and then the uh, Indonesia and Indochina, which is uh, 700 uh, million inhabitants. But really, the three cultures of the, uh, of the 22nd century are going to be the Chinese culture, the Western culture, and the Indian culture. And these three cultures, 
Two of them are uh, really uh, very uh, antagonist cultures. The Chinese culture, based in Lao Tse, Taoism, Confucianism, thinks that the group is the important, that the future is al already predetermined, and that you have to flow within that future and to let yourself l live that predetermination. So the group is much more important than the individual, and in the individual, confronts the group, is the group that can crush the individual. In the Western culture, it's completely different. We th uh, the Western culture thinks that the future is open. We build this future by our actions every day. And it is the individual that, uh, by, by his creativity and his proposals, is able to promote ideas, new ideas that will change society. So really, society needs the individual to be able to promote, the, through freedom, that capacity to, to change the future of, of that society. So it's completely antagonizing. The future is predetermined by the Tao, by Lao Tse. The future is free by Aristotle's and Plato and Hellenistic culture. And, and in between those two very different cultures, which uh, are, are already clashing, uh, and we are not talking about a military clash, that's not, uh, that's, that's not to be think of, uh, is more of an understanding of the way we have to, to govern ourselves and how to make decisions. In the middle of those two cultures is, is, is India. And the uh, culture of India is more defined by Krishna and, and by Buddha. And I, I like to remind, to remember, uh, the talk in the Gita between uh, Krishna and Arjun before the battle, where Krishna uh, tells to Arjun, uh, the future is determined, you have your karma, you have your destiny, you have to follow your destiny, you have to follow the karma. But if you are intelligent enough, and you really have the will to change that future, you can. No? And that is what winning the battle the next day, uh, Arjun was able to, to change that future. So that element, that singularity of really, if you are intelligent and capable enough, you can change the future, puts India in between the two cultures, but closer to the Western culture than to the Chinese culture. And so it's India in the future, the, the culture that is going to be able to make the balance between the three cultures that are going to determine the future of the world. So it is essential that India develops its, uh, its uh, uh, economic system to be able to take the place it deserves in the balance of the structure of, of the world and the globalization. And that position is meant to be through the metropolis of India that are the ones that really are the engines of the economy and the development of India. And we have the example of Delhi, Delhi, as we mentioned before, is a river crossing. So you have the location around the river with that bridge. And then from that, it expands. The roads and the system of transport expands from that crossing into different directions. And you have a very uh, structured rectangle. Uh, Delhi is not a circle. Delhi metropolis is a rectangle with uh, four corners, which are uh, Rotak, uh, Mirut, uh, Kurja, and uh, Riwat. And you see that the train system already is located within that structure. And we have to understand that to promote that, that process of organization. Uh, so uh, Delhi looks like a butterfly with the body in the center and the two wings that go both ways of the, of the river. And we have to understand that we have to make that butterfly more resilient and to make the connections necessary to make that body more, uh, more resilient. And obviously, there are priorities in the uh, investments of, of Delhi. The, uh, as I mentioned before, beyond 4 million inhabitants, a metropolis is mainly built on the tr uh, heavy transport, and that's rails. Delhi has that rail system. It cannot be just metro, which is more of an urban uh, solution. It has to be a, a regional structure, so the commuter trains that already exist have to be promoted and to have a, a frequency that will allow population to live. In the metro big metropolis of the world, 
population can live 55 kilometers away from the metropolis and they take 30 minutes, 20 minutes to get to the metropolis. And Delhi is not yet into that uh, system, that phase of development. And really, Delhi has to integrate all those uh, different cities and villages within a single metropolis. Because remember, as we mentioned, the more you integrate, the more efficient you are, and the more you multiply your GDP and your capacity around the world. This is the uh, uh, metropolitan diagram, the me mental map, the, met uh, the uh, metro matrix map of, of Delhi. And we immediately see that Delhi, with that main directionality of the river and the crossing of the river, the, the, the main directionality and the secondary directionality, can have a reticular system that will decongest the circular system of Delhi, which makes, at the end, the metropolis more congestive. No? So uh, Delhi has to think about how to organize the rail system in a, in a radial uh, connections, and then crossing those radial connections to make it more resilient and more alternative, and then a reticular system of roads which is some of them are already built, and so they have to be improved and connected, and others have to be the, the connection of the system, the bars and the knots necessary for the whole trust to work. No? And immediately you see some projects which uh, are essential in Delhi. No? Define the metropolis with a four-corner post uh, approach, 60 kilometers of uh, dimension, uh, which is the normal dimension of the metropolis, and there is going to be 42 million inhabitants in, 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 in a few years, in 2050, the largest metropolis of the world. So expand the commuter service uh, train uh, to these four corner post metropolis that now you, you are already producing one of those uh, rails, but it has to be expanded to the other three. Articulate a green space in between. I have not seen in the metropolitan plan of, of Delhi enough importance and, and how to integrate that green system within the metropolis. Delhi is going to grow in population and in housing uh, in figures which are staggering. So really, uh, Delhi should uh, locate 50 urban centralities along those train stations within the uh, commuter train. Uh, that is uh, on the range of 3 million dwellings uh, in, in the next uh, 30 years. So really, it needs in the range of 50 TODs, uh, transit-oriented development, to be able not to depend on the car, Delhi is going to multiply the number of cars. Uh, Delhi now has a, a ratio of car ownership on the range of two or three cars every 10 people. And with development, it will mean seven cars, eight cars every 10 people. So Delhi is going to multiply by three the numbers of cars in the streets. And the, uh, if you multiply by three, the, the problems of traffic are going to be immense. And that has to be solved not by tra traffic. It has to be solved by producing the transit system of the trains that will be the alternative to, 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 to the uh, traffic system. Mumbai. Mumbai has a very clear uh, uh, directionality, which is along the coast, which is the axis of the peninsula of Mumbai. Then you have the, the, the bay, then you have Navi Mumbai, then you have a reach of uh, hills, then you have another valley, then you have the, the different uh, foothills of the Indian plateau, and then you have the plateau. So uh, Mumbai has a very clear directionality. Mumbai is not run, round. Mumbai does not need a circular road. Mumbai needs to articulate those parallel lines by a structure that will relate them and will create the, uh, the reticular system. That proposal was made uh, three years ago in a workshop, in a metropolitan workshop done by, with the uh, Indian government, the Maharashtra state, and uh, the European Union uh, by ACCIONA. Um, it was very well understood by MMRDA. The, and, and MMRDA has uh, changed the metropolitan vision of, uh, of uh, uh, Mumbai into, uh, in, in, in the plan, and instead of having a, a round orbital system, as they, they did have uh, previously, they have created a reticular system that is going to work very, very well, much better. And that comes out of the um, mental map of Mumbai that uh, immediately links those different uh, uh, parallel system with the perpendicular ones, and then the big diagonals that go to Pune and Nashik that creates the expansion of uh, Mumbai beyond what now is understood as the metropolitan limits of Mumbai. Really, the, the metropolis of Mumbai 
includes Nashik and Pune, and it has to integrate a vision between, uh, uh, between Pune and Mumbai, which is quite easy because both are in the Maharashtra state and it can be uh, uh, led, uh, the leadership belongs to the Maharashtra state uh, government and to the chief minister to organize the, the system altogether. Mumbai then has very clear projects that have to be made. The East-West Green Rank Connection, which is essential, which is now the problem. So they are producing uh, bridges uh, across the bay, but it's not only that. It has to penetrate more into the inland and it has to cross the ridge of, uh, of uh, hills, which are uh, by Navi Mumbai, and has to go into the next valley that we call, um, we call uh, Saraswati Valley because we think that that valley has to have more of a, a high-tech development, scientific development linked to the airport, which is in the south for, for the ex export of those goods. The more developed an economy is, the more technological the goods are, the more ex uh, valuable they are, the less they take the, the boat, the more they take the plane. So all that scientific development uh, in, in, uh, in the Bay Area of San Francisco, there are 14 airports, of which three are passenger airports, and the other 11 airports are just for freight to, uh, to export all the scientific goods that the uh, um, uh, Bay Area of San Francisco produces. Mumbai, the same way, the Swarasati Valley of uh, technological and scientific production has to use the airport, which will be in the south, which will be, be built, and probably it will be needed an, another airport. Economic and, and financial positioning of, of Mumbai Mumbai has to be the capital of the Indian Ocean. Uh, it has to be the economic capital from Cape Town to Ho Chi Minh City. All that area of the globe has to be uh, economically uh, ruled by, by Mumbai. And for that, it has to have a very important financial and economic center. That can be the airport city, uh, not only the center of Mumbai as it, it is already is, but an expansion into the, into the uh, inland and the location of that is extremely important. It has to integrate transport, it cannot be dispersed and disintegrated, and it has to uh, coordinate the metro economy, as uh, it is the main strength of, of Mumbai, with the governments of the whole system. As we mentioned, Mumbai are Pune and Pune are part of the same uh, metropolis, no? uh, although they, are, they work independently, but they have to think about a unit that, that really coordinates and compensates and collaborates one with each other. Pune is growing so fast because it is within the range of Mumbai and the things that cannot take place in Mumbai go to Pune to locate and, and Pune's exports immediately go through Mumbai and go to the port of Mumbai and go elsewhere. No? So in Pune we have mainly two areas of Pune that have to be integrated. The corridor from Mumbai to Pune, which is highway, roads, uh, trains, uh, uh, and which is a very uh, specific corridor of production. And then in Pune to the southeast, uh, you have more of a residential area. And those two aspects of production and residence have to be integrated to make the, uh, the city work. And they have to be integrated not just by everyone going to the center. You, we, have to, we must have a, 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 a system that will be more uh, diverse and more polycentric. So the corridor of production uh, can expand and can expand to the north and to the south and uh, expanding in, in, in a very specific uh, structure. Pune has the, the, the ghats that go down to Mumbai. In those ghats you have different reservoirs and different lakes, and that is the main directionality of Pune, the north-south directionality, the same as, um, as Mumbai, because they are defined by the, uh, the Indian Plateau and the, and the uh, 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 sea plain. And this is the main directionality of Pune. And then the perpendicular one, which is perpendicular to that ridge of ghats, of mountains, and to the valley. And that is the line followed mainly by the uh, rivers that flow through Pune. So these two directionalities have to be worked out, both in terms of uh, train provision, uh, access uh, of train, 
to, to provide uh, mobility between the residential areas of Pune and the industrial areas of Pune, and they will be able to avoid the need of car and, 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 and traffic uh, congestion. And then uh, organizing the network of, uh, of green space and environmental quality spaces flowing within the city. Again, Pune has a, an airport which is well located within these two areas, but is far away from the train system and the future high-speed train that will go to Hyderabad and to Bangalore. So the connection between that train system, high-speed train system and the airport can be produced with a system of high-tech productivity area between those two air, uh, points of uh, uh, international uh, and national uh, transport, and that can be the area of evolution of, of Pune, uh, of productivity, of uh, technological products that will come out from the location of the actual uh, relevance of Pune in terms of uh, education, research. Pune is a city of, of, of education. Um, Pune is the, is the Boston of India. Uh, as, as, as a center of universities and, and knowledge. And that knowledge can have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, evolution of applicability, the technological application, and then the production uh, of, of goods that will be exported through the airport or through the train uh, in those systems. So Pune has a structure that can be developed and will put Pune in an international position in strength uh, coupling with, with Mumbai. So Pune really needs to develop the road network, not uh, in circular ways, not making uh, ring roads, but really making a, a reticular system. Uh, it has to develop a commuter train based on demand. The, the rails are there, so it has to be uh, uh, serviced. And uh, now there are some services, but they take one hour and a half, and that, that is not uh, how a metropolis can work. Those services have to be in the range of 30 minutes and not one hour and a half uh, distance. It, it has to develop the uh, high-tech uh, uh, corridor uh, between the airport and the uh, high-speed train and the train uh, uh, station. And it has to uh, create a, a metropolitan intelligence uh, through the, uh, the, uh, the uh, development of that knowledge that already Pune has into practical knowledge, technology, and high-tech and, and high uh, products. So the strategic priorities of uh, Pune are, are quite clear, no? the development of a knowledge, a technological development, research and innovation uh, for the uh, globalized world. And in that uh, moment, you need logistic centralities to, to organize that production. You need an airport city that will be able to, to put in the world those uh, production that will be, relate more to the air uh, as, as, as goods which are uh, expensive with light weight take the plane, as in uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area instead of the port. And uh, Pune will have to think about a freight airport, probably in the north of Pune, close to the industrial areas of production. The green and the blue network of Pune has to be integrated within the system of the metropolis. And uh, uh, this, this vision will uh, integrate the uh, TODs, the transit-oriented developments, the urban centralities of, of Pune, is, and instead of growing in a mass which is uncontrolled and spilling the wine of Pune uh, across the metropolis, it will rather have to put those uh, uh, the, that wine in different glasses, which are the TODs, the uh, urban centralities, where the population with high density residential, with the services, with the social facilities, with the, uh, the offices and commerce and so on are located. That's the principle of the TODs. And in that uh, position, Pune, instead of spilling the wine, will put the wine on glasses and, uh, and, and, and uh, let's drink for the future of Pune. Chennai. Chennai, again, has a very strong linearity, which is the coast of, of the uh, Bangladesh uh, 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 Gulf, and it is a north-south uh, uh, directionality. 
that uh, gives room to the float plane and then to the uh, uh, Indian, uh, Indian plateau. And uh, so it's a very strong north-south uh, directionality with the perpendicular one uh, that go inland. And that is shown by the uh, already existing rail system, which has those two alternatives along the coast and to the center of the, of the country. Uh, Chennai has the uh, different rivers and uh, rivers and creeks that go from that uh, uh, ghats in the, in the plateau to the, uh, to the sea and is using the ponds of this uh, sea plain to, to, uh, to, uh, as reservoirs of water for uh, Chennai. We, we know that Chennai uh, this year has had a very uh, strong difficulties with water. And because the monsoon, the climate change is changing the pattern of, uh, of uh, rain. And uh, what was enough in the past, uh, those uh, ponds for the uh, service, it, it only is able to hold water for one month and a half. And with climate change does not, does need uh, much more water, reservoirs which much more water to be able to confront long periods of drought that might be many months or even uh, years. No? And many countries around the world, many metropolises around the world, in the Mediterranean, in the California coast and so on, have experienced those droughts for many years and know how to manage that. And that requires a different approach of reservoirs of a larger capacity, not only a month and a half, but reservoirs that are able to, 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 uh, to serve the city for many months or even years. No? So there is a new water structure, a new urban structure, metropolitan, with those centralities, with those train system that has to be integrated. Chennai is in a very good position because uh, the Indian Plateau takes the water from the west to the east, so uh, uh, Chennai can have a lot of water if it knows how to store that water and to have reservoirs that will be able enough to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, hold water for, uh, for long droughts. No? So this is the new uh, position, the new situation in which those, uh, those uh, reservoirs that already exist in some areas of the East Ghats of, of India have to be linked because that drought can be different from the north of, uh, of the coast to the south of the coast and you have to share that water. There are political difficulties. Obviously, every state tries to hold the water for himself, but that is the role of a federal system and that collaboration between states. And then a system of, of uh, uh, of pipes that will take that water to the consumption areas of Chennai. It is, it is quite uh, surprising to see that uh, the cost of water around the world in, uh, in developed uh, metropolis like Madrid or like uh, Los Angeles is 70 cents of dollars, 0.7 dollars per cubic meter. And uh, this year in Chennai, the cost of water has been as much as uh, $7 per cubic meter. So 10 times more with a GDP, which is uh, in some cases compared to, to the American GDP, 10 times less. So the cost of water 10 times more and the GDP 10 times less is 100 times more expensive the water in Chennai than it should be. No? So the uh, priorities of Chennai are uh, the, uh, the water provision storage, as we have already mentioned, the, uh, to address the uh, growth of 50% of the population. Chennai is now 10 million inhabitants and it's going to be 15 million inhabitants uh, not too long from now. So it has to provide uh, the room for, for that 50% population growth. And that has to be, as we have mentioned for the other metropolis, around the uh, polycentric centralities, the TODs uh, based on the rail system. And uh, Chennai is going to confront another difficulty, which is the sea level rise, part of the climate change. And Chennai is in a very low ground, and it will have to develop areas of uh, mitigation of that sea level rise that at the end of the century can go as far as one or two meters higher than actually is. 
and the productive uh, land of, uh, of Chennai has to be based productive industrial. In, uh, Chennai is a city of industry and that industry has to be close to the hi uh, highways because the trucks, heavy trucks should not go into the city because of uh, pollution, because of danger, risk uh, and, and traffic uh, mismanagement. So it has to be along the highways and the actual ring roads, beltways of Chennai should take a north-south directionality and they should be the ones that will host the, uh, the uh, future production of Chennai. Let's mention about the water that normally in a metropolis only 20% of the water is for domestic production and 80% is for industrial production. And if uh, Chennai does not have water, it will not have water for the industrial production of Chennai. And so the labor and the industry will be stopped because of the lack of water. So if Chennai is not able to solve its problems of water, it will not only drink, it will neither eat because it will not be able to produce what Chennai does produce. We have been looking as well uh, through this project with other uh, metropolises like Ahmedabad, like Surat, like Hyderabad, like Alcotta. But uh, to make this presentation short, shorter, uh, we are not going to get into uh, these uh, details, but uh, the same kind of approach can be produced for those other uh, metropolises or for any metropolis of India. And the project obviously can be extended to the 51 metropolis of India that are, are now more than 1.5 million inhabitants. Within the context of India, the same kind of approach can be taken. We have, this is the Indian structure. We have every small uh, uh, yellow square is 1 million inhabitants. We see how uh, New Delhi is the main metropolis, but the area of Mumbai, uh, Surat, uh, Ahmedabad, Pune is a huge uh, area of productivity. We see in the uh, map to the, uh, to the right that uh, the population of India is mainly located along, along the Ganges Valley. And, uh, and if we compare that with the areas of GDP and productivity, uh, the, product, the lower GDP is along that area as well. No? So the location of population and location of productivity is in some way uh, confronted. Population and low GDP are in the same area. So it could be a focus of the Indian government to organize these areas to, to, to build up on the potential of that population being integrated in a productivity system uh, for export and to position India in the world. And immediately from that kind of analysis of the men mental map of India, as we have seen, uh, with that uh, rhombus that is produced by the uh, Ganges Valley, the uh, corridor in Delhi, uh, uh, Mumbai, and the, uh, the coast of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the East Coast and uh, the access to Hyderabad and Bangalore, in this, into that rhombus, the east side of that rhombus requires a strong effort and immediately uh, from the, uh, the mental maps approach we see that is a road corridor, a high-speed train corridor has to be produced to Calcutta and then in the future as well to Bangalore through Chennai, a freight airports uh, every 250 kilometers, which are the logistic centers for that uh, export of that productivity, and with industrial zones according to the needs of uh, productivity and uh, strategic education of a population to be able to feed the production of those specific goods for international market. And that is what will put India, as we mentioned in a, uh, some time ago, put India in this world role of one of the three civilizations in between the Chinese and the Western uh, civilization with a, a global role, not only in economic or in social as well in pol political and cultural role. We think the uh, federal state and the uh, states of India uh, have to collaborate we mentioned how the metropolis are not work like cities in a unitary system. They are work in a, in a, in a greed uh, 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 reticular system 
uh, matrix system, and so the governance is completely different from the cities, and that governance has to be developed. And uh, there are only four ways of governing those metropolis that are more like countries than like cities. If we have to take an example of how to govern a metropolis, we should look at countries, not cities. Uh, so countries, there are only four ways of three or four ways of uh, managing a country. There is the confederal system, there is the federal system, and there is the unitary system. And the unitary system has two, two alternatives. The centralized, where everything is decided in the uh, ministries in, in the central government, or the decentralized, an example is France, where the uh, uh, president uh, appoints uh, a delegate, appoints what they call the préfet in France, which is a person that in each department, in each province of France, uh, coordinates the role of the ministries of Paris uh, to make that the roads and the hospitals will be integrated and not uh, scattered around in a, in a non-coordinated way. So the unitary system, you have the centralized system with the ministries that do everything, or the decentralized where you have the delegation of the central government in each of the areas of the... So for the metropolis, these are the four systems. There are not 400 million different alternatives. Those are the four systems. And in around the world, uh, the confederations have not worked for a long time. We have the Panathinaika, the Greek uh, city states, uh, 12 city states were a confederation. The Hanseatic League of the Germans was a confederation. Uh, 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 the USA, uh, North America, when it was created, was a confederation. And then they became uh, the, the government of Washington, took more power. and. and and, and they made the union after the Civil War, and then around Latin America there are many confederations. Confederations can, it's better to have a confederation than nothing at all, but it does not work in the long term. No? So really the metropolis have to work either not by, by adding up the mayors of the metropolis, really by having an integrated government of that metropolis that will be able to make the right decisions at the right scale. No? And that has to be through a federation or through a, a, a unitary decentralized system. So the, uh, there are three typologies of countries around the world, which are the countries where the main metropolis is 60% of the GDP of the country, like Manila, like uh, Cairo, like Buenos Aires. In those circumstances, central government will never allow the metropolises to have political power, political decision capacities, because they are 60-70% of the GDP of the country. And that will make the national government redundant if the metropolis really takes a, an important role in decision making. And there are the countries which the metropolis are 5%, uh, like China, like USA, like Germany, like Italy, like India, although in India, uh, Mumbai is 11%, uh, that in these countries, it is possible to have a metropolitan capacity to make decisions because they don't jeopardize or they don't challenge the power of the central government. And then the, the metropolis in, in between, like France, uh, Paris is 25% of the GDP of France, London, 30% uh, of the GDP of, of, of England, Madrid, 20% of the GDP of Spain. In these countries, uh, systems more flexible have to be found depending on the culture and the structure of the, of the economy. But in India, which is a, a country which is in the area of the federal system and so on, metropolis have the possibility to have a governance a structure related to the power of the states, to Maharashtra, to Tamil Nadu, uh, to Gujarat, uh, to, uh, and, and that is the way forward in the uh, collaboration between central government of Delhi and the different state governments of, uh, of uh, the India. So we have uh, seen uh, many aspects. We have seen the importance of metropolis, if the metropolis of a country do not work, that country does not work. Metropolis are essential to position a country in the global economy. And so India is in that kind of shape. If the metropolis of India do not work, we, uh, India doesn't work. We have seen as well how metropolis have to work, which is completely different from how cities work. So they need really a, a different vision, integrated vision, because that integration is what makes that, those metropolis efficient, equitable, and sustainable. So it has to have an integrated system. And um, 
if those integrated system uh, is not found, uh, then the metropolis will not be able to work. And uh, it, 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 how it has to have an integrated system. And we have seen how these needs apply to the metropolis of India. We have seen uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Pune, Chennai, but we could have seen Ahmedabad, Hyderabad, uh, Calcutta, or Surat. Uh, and each of them requires a different approach because every animal is different. Any, every animal needs a, a different acupuncture chart to decide what are the strategic projects that have to be uh, put forward. But we have seen the case for, uh, for, for India, for these metropolis, and that can be extended to the other metropolis of India. You have 51 metropolis of 1.5 million inhabitants and beyond, and each of them really requires a strategic vision to position not only their state, but India in the global position India deserves in this balance of the future of the world between these three great uh, cultural uh, units.